It is Thursday, April 29th, 2021, and this is this week's Q&A video. Each week, I try to gather questions from various members of the greater Cypher system and Numenera community, and I dedicate a video where I give my answers and speculations on the topic. If you'd like a question to be answered in next week's video, just leave one down in the comments below, or find me on Twitter at INFConstruct. These videos go up every week, and this time we have some questions about the expansiveness of the Ninth World as a setting, the second volume of the game, Destiny, and a question about the economy of Numenera. Stick around until the end for a little bit of an update on the channel as well, but for now let's get into the questions. Nopi asks, here's a question for you, though not a rule-related one. How have you used the vast space of the Ninth World that is left blank by the books to give GMs and players room to build our own Ninth World? Have you settled any campaigns there yet? So this is really a great question because it can be answered in so many ways, all of which really highlight the malleability of the setting of the Ninth World and the ways it can serve as its own unique and original creative space with its own lore, while at the same time offering a genre canvas to players and GMs who want to play with the concepts of science fantasy in a very free and open way. The Ninth World is filled with a lot of blank, expansive space, both in the original map, as represented by the nameless cities, towns, villages, and places of interest for you to use, and in the supercontinent map as it was fully revealed in the Ninth World guidebook. My own games have always made extensive use of the spaces in between the settled areas on the main map. When plotting out adventures and campaign ideas, I'll often start with an entry in the book and then see what is in the surrounding area to advance the story. The Ninth World setting is sort of like world building on cruise control. The books do the heavy lifting of establishing key areas for you with enough local info and recent history to theorize potential story hooks for a game, and the open space allows you the freedom to build from scratch and choose where you'd like to go with a narrative. In my most recent games, I've used specific areas like the forests north of Jastin and the Sea Kingdom of Gon to place hidden, original characters and discoveries. I took great creative license with the town of Deverlash to the north of Jastin as well, establishing it not merely as a Vargellan town separate from humans, as I like to avoid displays of segregation and racism in my games, but as a sort of anarchist settlement often referred to as Free Deverlash. Again, the beauty of the Ninth World is a setting untied to pseudo-historical representations of real countries like Europe. The types of governments and societies that can exist here can be limitless. There's no reason not to have an anarchist settlement, which has found a synergy with its social spirit and Vargellan cultural values. Free Deverlash is a wild and wonderful place, and has served as a great stopping point for my players who are traveling from a more traditional or expected town. In another game, I've used the unnamed town west of Jirek and Thamor to provide a nice shift in tone as the PCs arrived here under much urgency. The narrative has thus far involved a pretty devastating incident in the populated city of Jirek, so in fleeing the area, the PCs are now laying low or taking a brief break in this area, which, given that it's been left blank by the books, I can use the canvas of the space to tie in character stories more originally and natively, with very little if any retconning or rewriting of what's already in the books. When it comes to the expansive size of the continent, however, I've yet to explore much outside of the steadfast and the beyond. As I said just before, to me the Ninth World is a canvas for role-playing in the genre of science fantasy, and it's a canvas that MCG has provided a lot of fun material to work with language to work and play with. Where I really see the potential in the great expanse of the supercontinent, however, is the freedom to depart from the lore and establish places in this setting that make the most of the genre in a completely original space. I can see everything from running games that are in remote locations far off on the continent, to fully formed countries and expanses that rival the steadfast in size. Perhaps there are human civilizations elsewhere in the Ninth World who have lived longer than the 900 years of history the citizens of the steadfast country have. Perhaps the Numenera takes on wildly different forms that go beyond anything we've seen in the setting, meaning that we can really play with the science and the fantasy of science fantasy without the restriction of lore. I think, especially for those who may truly love the premise of Numenera, but don't want to play in a published setting, seeing the supercontinent as the place to create original science fantasy settings is a very exciting prospect, much like how people use the rules and general sense of, say, D&D to have their own unique fantasy setting that may or may not take place in an established one, but is nonetheless still a fantasy game. For the next question, Robert Winslade asks, would love to hear you talk about some of the content in Destiny. Coming from a D&D background, the character types and adventure formats encouraged in Destiny feel very different from what I'm used to, and I'm struggling a bit to wrap my head around them and how they should be integrated with the slightly more traditional archetypes and adventures in Discovery. 
Yeah, so let's talk about Destiny, or rather, let's talk about Numenera when we really incorporate the full extent of what Destiny has to offer. But first, a disclaimer. I got into Numenera when it first hit Kickstarter in the early years of the last decade. The original Orange Core book was, to me, all that Numenera was with a few extra books. I took my time getting around to Discovery and Destiny. With Discovery being essentially a slightly revised version of the original book, I was happy to get back into Numenera without learning many, if any, real substantial changes to the rules. Destiny, however, was a different story. To be completely honest, while I first familiarized myself with the material in Destiny back in about 2018 or 2019 or so, I did so with a very surface level understanding of these new rule types. It wasn't until recently that I really began synthesizing this new material in my head. What I've come to so far is an understanding of the different lenses for viewing an RPG, particularly a science fantasy one, that Destiny offers. The community and material rules provide an abstraction of aspects of the world such as settlements and the salvaging and crafting of specific materials that allows the game to grow in its vocabulary. And what I mean by that is Numenera, with these added rules, now becomes a game where the size and overall health of a community can now provide GMs and players with a bit more structure and grounding. For example, a community's rank indicates what the average level of most things in the community will be. A rank 3 community would have level 3 guards, bartering in the market would probably be around level 3, sneaking out of or into a jail cell would be level 3, the locks on most people's doors would be level 3, and the book indicates that there's some variability here, some things can be higher or lower. But giving a rank to a community, the actual presence of this settlement, will then change from a narrative framing device to one that keys into the math that you're working with in the game, which can really help define the space as something more than a narrative concept. The same is true of crafting and salvaging. All of these new rules definitely feel a bit more math and procedure heavy than what Numenera has traditionally offered, but they're really great at scaffolding out some basic structure to things that otherwise were just handled, for the most part, through narrative and roleplay. And this is where we can really start to understand where we can take advantage of these types, because these new types deal with these new systems more directly. They affect everyone in the game, but these types key into these new rules more efficiently. The new types do have some clear parallels to traditional RPG class types, as the Archai can be very bard-like, the Rites are similar to alchemists in some ways, and the Delves are sort of a low combat ranger. Or at least that's the way I see them, and if that parallel kind of helps you structure these new types into a game, that's great. But when really thinking about how to incorporate these new character types and rules into your game, I'd really suggest taking a look at the 2000 film Pitch Black. I recently rewatched this for the first time in quite a while and was quite struck by the narrative framing, the characters, and the struggle that takes place over the movie's stories, and how much the rules of Numenera Destiny can really help provide a game structure for narrative experiences of the kind in Pitch Black. As the first in the Riddick films, Pitch Black and its sequels have a very science fantasy feel, just set in more of a space opera than Numenera is. Pitch Black in many ways is a survival story, one where not every character is necessarily a combat-focused archetype. We only really have two characters who would be traditional fighting-style characters, Riddick himself and Johns, perfectly deserving of the glaive types if we're using Numenera terminology. The rest of the cast, however, demonstrate roles that would be more close to what we would see in Destiny. The Imam, for example, very much feels like an Argus. Carolyn Fry, from time to time, sort of feels like a Rite. The drama of the film is survival, and there are multiple scenes where the characters have to resort to what they can salvage around them in order to get through all of this. In fact, watching this movie again in 2021, I was surprised by how much the conflict on display here isn't just about heroes fighting villains. There is physical contact, and those characters who are built to be the fighters do have their moments, but that is not the only thing their strength plays a role in. If you're familiar with the plot of the film, you know that the main conflict cannot be solved by Riddick just punching and stabbing his way out of this. He has to work with the other characters, and they all have to work together to survive the planet and what lives on the planet. Riddick's role as a big muscle man who can kill anyone very much creates some interesting dialogue with characters who are the complete opposite. Paris P. Ogilvy, antiquities dealer, entrepreneur. Where should be Riddick? Escape convict, murderer. That's, that's a particularly good Shiraz, it, it, it's, it's a lovely drop. It, it, it's, it's very expensive. By all means, please, 
up yourself. But the nature of the story means that different types of characters have to be looked to for various strengths and weaknesses to move the story forward. If you're looking for a narrative situation to build an adventure out of that really would take advantage of the new character types, I'd highly recommend thinking of a survival type scenario like the kind we see in Pitch Black. So when it comes to thinking about how to use the less traditional character types in Destiny, as well as the expanded rules, I think Pitch Black is a fantastic template for observing a narrative situation with unusual characters thrust together, not all of which can survive on their physical might alone, and for the ways you could use salvaging and crafting rules to structure and gamify the process of crafting to make things feel a little bit more real and tactile as you're using the various pieces of Iodum to define what types of material reality exists in the Ninth World. Our last question for this week comes in from Palenda. The economy with shins is a point I think that is confusing. Maybe I'm so used to real life value of money that it's harder to relate the economy system in Numenera to what I have here. A new character can start with as low as three shins, I think. Not even enough for a week of rations. I guess my question is how to get a better grip on the way money works in Numenera. I am probably just too used to everything having a price in gold in other fantasy role-playing games. Shins are really interesting, and I've spent a great deal of time in my experiences with Numenera thinking about what shins really are in the game, mechanically and narratively. You're absolutely right in saying that the value of shins is sometimes hard to really understand, and I think this is a point where the narrative can sort of lose its believability or relatability. Much of our contemporary lives in the 21st century are built around money and our understanding of money and its value. I really believe that the design of shins as a currency in a tabletop role-playing game is built on a philosophy that gives GMs and players license to handle money in their game however they feel it's appropriate for the story they're telling. Most of us come to RPGs for great interactive experiences, and simulating an economy is not often high on the list of thrilling moments, at least not for this type of medium. The meta of shins, it is my belief, is that they are a super abstracted currency for you to handle as you see fit. Their simplicity means that very little paperwork has to be kept. It means that a scene in a tavern in the Ninth World will likely be more focused on who is in the tavern and what story will develop here as opposed to needing to keep track of the financial books of the tavern as a business entity. The setting of the game seems to suggest that shins are just sort of found in random places and people use them to trade, but it leaves open the potential for you as the GM to describe them however it is you wish. If you don't want to be burdened with an accounting simulator mechanic, shins can just come and go and you only need to keep track of them if we're talking about significant amounts of money. Since the game lets you get things like followers or places of residence through XP, I feel like Numenera doesn't expect players necessarily to interface with some kind of simulated economy. That said, we are humans living in a very money-focused world, and so it is hard sometimes to imagine societies existing in places where the economic structure is vastly different, or the antithesis of what we currently live in. The book does, however, offer some broad suggestions about shins, including the fact that some are minted and meant for specific regions. It says this and then never offers an outline of the minting process or what the difference between a minted and unminted shin is in terms of value. To me, this is the book telling me as a GM that if I want to have a more detailed economic structure in my game, which I do find some value in as a storyteller, I can just make it up for the most part. I really like the idea of shins that may only be minted or accepted in certain areas, as this can key into an interesting situation for the characters. Say they spend a great deal of time traveling to a new city, only to find out that the city has mandated that merchants may only accept minted shins in the area. This puts the PCs in a bind. Perhaps they have to have their current shins exchanged, and the value may be exchanged for less, meaning that the PCs will lose money to just participate in the economy of a specific area. This may not be true, however, of a black market, meaning that PCs can trade in unminted shins illegally, but with all the risks that may come with that. So now you have the shins playing a role in shaping the experience for the player. Do they exchange their shins for minted shins that are only accepted in one place and will cause them to lose money? Or do they risk it and try to get what they need on the black market? Both options imply that different quest outcomes and NPCs will play a role in the game strictly based on this decision alone. To flesh out shins a bit more, I 
I don't see anything wrong with having divisions of shins. People may trade in one unit of a shin, half a shin, a quarter of a shin, a tenth, a single cent of one, even if the book says otherwise about dividing shins. This is a really simple approach to just flesh out a currency system a little bit more, and at least for me, I find benefit in having a slightly more elaborate money system than just single shins. However, Numenera's destiny salvaging materials, the Iodum, offer another way to structure money and economy that is far better than shins. You can just reserve shins for simple, insignificant daily purchases at various shops. Looking at the Iodum chart in Destiny, however, and using those materials for trade is a really great way to have stories and narratives that rely on large sums of money. If you have a heist adventure where the PCs must break into a bank vault or some private collection of Ninth World valuables, have their target be an expensive item from the salvage chart. Perhaps they're stealing large amounts of quantum or stamped ingots of azure steel or tamed iron. I'm very much reminded of the use of Beskar in The Mandalorian as a material that works for both trade and craft. It also has important cultural value to the Mandalorians. This kind of narrative play with material in fictional representations of a world and culture and economy is very easy to have in a Numenera game by using the salvage rules in Destiny. It's also a great way to start incorporating the salvaging and crafting mechanics in your game a little bit more slowly, but still very naturally. Introduce it as a currency first, albeit a very expensive currency that is often being traded for significant amounts, and then proceed on to the just regular salvaging and crafting you may come across throughout the course of the game. The other benefit of using Iodum as a kind of currency is that the chart featured on page 110 of Numenera Destiny in conjunction with the salvage rules provides relative value and scarcity which is really great for getting a feel for how rare or expensive some materials may be. The difference between units of synth steel compared to, say, data orbs has a clear relationship, and we understand from the salvage rules how rare or difficult it is to come across these materials in the world. This means that some may be more sought after or desired than others. This is excellent for a more dynamic currency than what shins offer. The book states that Iodum should usually be thought of as substantially more valuable than shins, so it is understood that these materials may be traded as well as they are crafted with. But where they enter the actual economy of the Ninth World, however, is several layers above what shins are traded for. I really do advise using shins for the payment of things that you don't wish to maintain any bookkeeping for. Have players spend a few shins at the bar and pay little mind to the cost to have a couple of drinks. Have players take on a quest to deliver 40,000 Io worth of Midnight Stones to a mysterious and wealthy Nano who lives far out in the beyond, and then we have a quest where the value of traded materials not only offers more to the game structurally, but is narratively more interesting. Shins for frivolous costs and Io where there's something of substantial value to be traded is a great rule to follow if you find the economy as it's presented in Numenera Discovery to be a little bit lacking. And that's it for this week's questions. Thank you so much to my subscribers for submitting them. And if there's any further interest in these topics, feel free to ask about it and I'll consider dedicating a whole video to the subject if it feels necessary. As an update on the channel, I'm really excited to see that we've now passed the 300 subscriber mark and are still climbing. I'm really happy to see so much energy and enthusiasm for Numenera. As the channel progresses, I only hope to keep providing informative and entertaining content. There will be new Q&A videos every week, provided I have enough material to work with, and specific videos dedicated to a single topic or product review will go up at least two to three times per month. I do also want to mention that I run regular Numenera one-shots on the Cypher Unlimited Discord server. If you are not already on said server, I highly recommend it as it's one of the best, most welcoming, inclusive, and respectful gaming communities out there. I'll be running at least one one-shot a month, if not more, for the remainder of 2021, so if you'd like to jump into a game with your own character or a pre-generated one I'll provide for you, keep an eye out on the Looking for Group channel on the Cypher Unlimited Discord server, and a massive heart felt thank you to everyone who works hard to keep that space so incredibly awesome for fans of Cypher System games. If you enjoyed this video, please go ahead and hit subscribe, leave a question in the comments below if you want a question to be featured in the next Q&A video, and follow me on Twitch and Twitter for various updates and other forms of content.